evening, everyone who is still coming in. Oh, it is so nice to see you all for this, I can't believe it is the last already um, of the Nava Advocacy Workshop sessions. My goodness, the 18th week, um, our Arts Down the Hill debrief. Um, I'm Esther Natalitas, I'm the Executive Director of Nava, and I am on the lands of the Boomerang and the Woiwurrung Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation here in Nara, also called Melbourne. Um, it's um, a very grey day today, which of course makes it the perfect weather for getting together with everyone and talking about um, a whole range of things. Um, and I can see people are still coming in. Please, as ever, use the chat to tell us where you are, what country you're on, um, what it's like where you are. Um, this is um, the final of um, our 18 weeks together through the NAV Advocacy Program. We have had uh, such um, extraordinary time together finding ways to skill up in advocacy, talking about the key issues um, in the arts at the moment, looking at how policy uh, is made, um, looking at um, media engagement and that aspect of advocacy and then of course that political engagement and heading into that national day of advocacy focus Arts Day on the Hill which was last Wednesday the 12th of August. Um, now as ever this session uh, as with all the sessions are recorded um, and the podcast will be uh, on the website tomorrow. It is also live captioned with thanks to Helen. Hello, Helen, who is in Brisbane captioning. Um, and the link uh, has just posted there uh, to the live captioning so that you can click on that uh, and see the words appear, uh, which is always um, super handy um, when you're trying to um, follow along. Um, and of course, that means that um, the session is not just video recorded, but also transcribed and the transcription will also appear on our website tomorrow alongside all of the podcasts in the entire NAVA advocacy program. So you can go back and, uh, and, and have a good look at all of those, um, which is just fantastic. So today, let's look back on this year um, this um, uh, bizarre, disrupted pandemic year. First of all, I hope everyone is happy and safe and comfortable where you are and that everyone is healthy. Um, oh, thank you to Leia. Leia is our communication and advocacy manager. She's just posted the link to all of the podcasts as well. So you'll see them all there every single week in the, in, in the whole uh, program. We're going to look back on... Um, on, on those sessions. We're going to talk about Arts Day on the Hill last week and we're going to hear from Nadia Odlin, uh, who has just said hi to everyone from Gadigal Land. We're going to solve that mystery, Anna, of where has Esther's blue hula hoop gone? It is still behind me. Uh, it's hiding away somewhere. It's funny you should ask that because I just got this kind of critical mass of people asking about the hula hoop in meetings. I thought I might just put it somewhere a little bit more subtle. So it is actually still still behind us somewhere. Uh, it's just not, not quite as visible. Uh, so we are going to hear from Nadia in a sec. We are also going to hear uh, from Shah Sawani, uh, who I can't see on the call quite yet, um, and hopefully will, will appear soon so that we can hear from artists who took part in Arts Day on the Hill. Um, and also uh, in about 30 or 40 minutes, we're also gonna be joined by Nicholas Picard, who presented a few weeks ago. Nicholas is the Director of Public Affairs at APRA AMCOS, and is a former uh, policy advisor to state and federal labor governments, uh, including federally at the time of the writing of the National Cultural Policy. Um, and he's someone who uh, you had a great response to. In fact, someone said, can, can Nick come back every week? Uh, and, you know, no, he can't. Um, so he will be back to offer, um, you know, a bit of that political reflection as well on the advocacy year and on Arts Day on the Hill in general. And as we do, 
reflect, and I really want to hear from as many of us as possible about what you did on Arts Day on the Hill, particularly. I know Anna Glynn is here and others who, um, um, and accordingly, uh, uh, Adam as well, who, who and Rob, who organised your own MP meetings, and so we definitely want to hear about um, those things as well. Um, we will go uh, and reflect back on the program as well. I'll, I'll pull up the... Uh, the, the guide in a sec and, and, um, and look at the handbook. And then we're going to spend some time looking at what's next, what's next for advocacy together. How do we sustain all of this good work and good thinking, that this, this momentum and hopefully um, the connections, the relationships that you've all built together, that, that, that deep connection to NAVA, but also um, the conversations and collaborations that, that you've all been having uh, through this and the kinds of things to be done together. So um, let's look back, first of all, on um, the entire program. I am just going to um, open up um, the uh, handbook, which hopefully you're seeing on the screen, uh, the very last one, which is about understanding the impact. Uh, please give me some kind of textual sign uh, that you can indeed see that. Um, and let's um, reflect back. Oh, thanks, Caroline. First in there. Um, let's um, reflect back on uh, the entire program um, and um, where where to, or you know, how, how we got to here. So we started with that good look at um, arts advocacy um, and work of particular organisations um, and advocates. Quite an extraordinary, first of all, before I kind of zoom right in there, it's been an extraordinary 16 plus two week program. We've had four weeks on advocating the arts. We've had another four on um, understanding policy development. Uh, we've had another four on understanding the media and then also getting into understanding the politics and achieving national impact. We've talked about advocacy being uh, not just something that is about how you connect with um, politicians as decision makers, but how we have a range of conversations together, um, what some specific arts issues are, um, and looking at uh, people in organisations who do that sort of thing for a living while also um, running uh, membership and network organisations like NAVA. But we also heard from artists who were involved in last year's Arts Down the Hill. Um, we uh, looked at issues in First Nations advocacy. Um, we had, um, as with every end of a four-week block, a Q&A with a politician. Um, we went into policy development, looking at, you know, um, where does the art sit locally, nationally, internationally? Where are the barriers to, to really great policy development? We look at the media and why it is that, um, you know, that some things make news, some things don't. And so, and, you know, how some things sometimes make news in ways that really frustrate us when, um, when politicians um, co-opt or manipulate the work of artists. And so in those circumstances, how best to engage with the media. And then we got into the politics of it all so that we could... Um, have that great um, engagement uh, with Arts Day on the Hill and really look at, uh, in a national day of focus, building a critical mass, connecting with MPs in person or via social media, uh, re re uh, um, researching who they are, their background. Um, given Palette wasn't sitting, we had a bit of a critical mass focus. Uh, from 2 to 3 p.m., which would have been question time, which we turned into artist question time. Um, we looked at, uh, you know, ways that we could do that um, and, um, you know, the, uh, the response had been absolutely extraordinary. Um, and then we talked about you know, starting to look at um, how we um, maintain those relationships and so today's conversation is about debriefing. What did we learn? What was most useful? What was most challenging about all of this? What kinds of things would we have done differently? Um, and questions for everyone to keep thinking about throughout our whole 90 minutes together today. And please um, 
you know, join the chat with, with, with these. We'll have some guests in just a sec. How has the way that you advocate for the arts changed or the way that you articulate your practice to different groups of people, the way that you engage with or intend to engage with political processes? And really interestingly, are there commitments to future advocacy development that you're keen to make? And how can we make those commitments? Now, I should say that after today's session, we're also going to send you, and everyone who's been registered for the program, we're going to send you a survey so that we can get some you know, good specific information, make sure that we've got um, you know, all that good feedback um, to reflect on this year and, and, and then build up next year's. So big advance thanks to everyone for filling that out. Not a long survey, um, but also really good for reflection as well. So I'm just going to close this and I'm going to invite Nadia to join um, and um, I also I don't see Shah on the list and so I hope that he received the uh, update today with the link to kind of get in. Um, but Nadia, I'm going to make you a presenter. Uh, and that is going to uh, shift you uh, in some way so that we can see you uh, unlocking your mic and your camera. And hopefully, there you are. Oh, hello. Hi. Um, now, there is the button to press to kind of know. I don't want to stay. I want just in the middle. Um, ah, thank you. That was Leia fixing that. Hello, Nadia. How are you? I'm well, thanks. How are you? Oh, I am good. Ah, now what work of Magritte is that? That's not the voice of. Uh, that's not no, the voice of silence, is it? Over the Pyrenees. No, mm. uh, I forget. <laughs> but there's a very cute. Oh, God, my head's in the way. There's a cute work by Ivy Warren, that one that says, I need you. Oh, I like that. Um, so that's a great, that's better work than the Matisse. <laughs> oh, that is super great. Now, now you, where are you today? You are on the lands of, oh, yes, you have to let us know. You are in Gadigal country. Ooh, sorry, it's just breaking at the moment. Yes, you have frozen, but I can still hear you. Can you still hear me? Oh, technical problem. Okay, hopefully. No, I can. Yep, hang on. No one. I can see there's movement. It looks I'm going like to walk downstairs to be next to my yes. internet modem. Good idea. Yes, close to the internet is good. Definitely good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I'm just. Can you hear me better now? Can definitely hear you. Oh, yeah, and the vision is better as yeah. well. Okay, yeah. cool. Oh, okay. lovely. All right, so. Um, so tell us, oh, and yeah, just, um, yes, angle slightly so that the light's not behind you. Perfect. Getting all the, we're just styling you now. This is fantastic. Very good. Getting a tour in my house. Lovely. All right, so tell me, how was, how was Arts Down the Hill for you? It was really fascinating. Um, I think particularly I enjoyed the meetings in with the MPs. Not that uh, we really said very much as the artist advocates apart from introducing ourselves, um, but it was it felt interesting to be at the table and to be present for that even like as just a, um, you know, a real face of um, art industry sitting there, you know, rather than um, any of the conversations being had seeming to be directed towards like very abstract, like who are these people sort of thing. So I felt like that was the value of being in on that meeting. But then the personal value for me was also just uh, watching and um, seeing how the politicians framed things or tried to guide the conversation and also watching you, Esther, and seeing how you guided the conversation in various ways as well. <laughs> well, okay. Tell us more specifically then about both of those, the, the, the politicians first. Um, tell us about which, which meetings you went to and, and, and what were they like? How was it maybe different to what you expected or maybe exactly what you expected? Um, so I was in a meeting with Trent Zimmerman and 
Oh my gosh, I'm having a mental blank now. The other one that I was in on the the shadow minister for the arts, Labour. Tony Burke. Thank you. My head just kept going out and then I couldn't get it to go out. Tony Burke. Um, Tony articulated very uh, well what his position is on what he thinks the arts need. Um, he seemed to be a very uh, passionate and strong advocate for the arts and for creating arts policy. Um, of course, being not in government at the moment is, you know, I kept keeping in my mind that it's easier for him to say those sorts of things, not being someone who's then you're going to turn around and be like, well, where is it? <laughs> you know? um, but that was, you know, it was great the way he spoke about it made me think, oh, well, you, you'd get my vote if um, it was at that time. Uh, but then when we came to be then talking to Trent Zimmerman, who, of course, is actually in government at the moment, what I was fascinated to watch uh, with you, Esther, in particular, was that I felt that your approach really changed from when you were talking to Tony to when you were talking to Trent. Um, and it became much more focused um, on specific things and, you know, not letting it, the conversation be, I guess, too general or, or washy. Um, in fact, you know, there were points where you were quite specifically being to him, actually, I had a meeting with so-and-so and we delivered a four-page document with statistics and recommendations and I can forward that on to you after this conversation. It was really quite Which I did. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And and how would you then, yeah, what, um, thinking about the, the, the difference between there, why, why do you think I did that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess for me it felt like the, the when you were talking with the shadow minister, there was a lot of relationship building that was going on and making sure that they, you both knew who each other were and um, they knew your priorities and that, you know, that they were articulating what they could do for you. So it's sort of like a relationship building thing. And that was the way I was perceiving it. And then when talking to someone who was in government, it was it felt like it was much more about action and um, also uh, looking at really sort of achievable um, and actionable asks um, that they could go forward with because they actually do have power to do things. Yeah, yeah, precisely. Mm. Um, I mean, with, you know, when we meet people in opposition, um, yeah, it's, it's fantastic uh, to hear them exactly as Tony Burke did to really outline with some passion, um, you know, what they believe in. And we want them to sustain that passion. We want them to mm. talk to other people about it. We want them to develop policy so that, uh, you know, when it comes to election time, um, 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 they are actually going to make those part of the platform, um, and because um, I think he, I think he, I can't if he said this in that conversation or in um, something else recently, the whole kind of well, you know, we didn't win the election, and if we had, you know, blah blah blah. And I know that um, Labor, uh, you know, were very disappointed, obviously, uh, because of that whole poll situation, and 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 you know, having almost expected to win, and having put so many different policies together. So, from our point of view, we don't want any party to think, oh well we lost because of um, having all these great policies. We actually want them to sustain the great, you know, what's good about the policies mm. um, and also maintain that momentum because, you know, it's great to be in the parliament, but it's probably, you know, it's probably less fun to be in opposition. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, you know, we want them to get, you know, to, to stay motivated, engaged. And then, yeah, absolutely, when a member of government says, oh, look, that's really interesting, to be able to straight away say, oh, and I can provide you with some evidence so that when mm. you follow up this conversation, um, you've got the stuff to hand. And, of course, Trent and I have emailed about that and I have sent that information. Mm. Um, you know, it's so important, as we've been saying in our preparation, that meetings have a purpose mm -hmm. uh, you know we're meeting with you today for this reason and this is the kind of outcome yeah that we like now tell us also about Trent because something that really impressed me was um the preparation that Trent yeah. had done so it was it was actually really nice and um you know I was quite surprised and delighted by the fact that he had gone away and done a little bit of research on each of the artists that he knew he'd be in a meeting with. Um, 
I don't know why that should surprise me so much. Maybe my expectations should be that high always, but it, he did it in a really good way that, you know, when, you know, I just sort of briefly introduced myself, then he was, he said, uh, oh, and I've seen from your website that you make really big sculptures. How have you been managing that during the COVID time? And I was like, oh, well, thank you. <laughs> and so that was, um, yeah, I was impressed by that. Uh, and even just from, something that would be good for me to remember any time that I'm in a meeting with someone. Uh, him doing that put me on his side very quickly. <laughs> and it very much it was a very good um, tactic of, you know, just of respect and um, relationship forming with someone that you're in a meeting with. So having the little things that you can throw out that you know about them and show that you've taken interest is really good. That is a very good observation in terms of, of a political tactic, uh, mm -hmm. which Rob McCready has uh, rightly identified as the old charm and disarm. Mm -hmm. um, when you're in a brief meeting with someone uh, and you never met them before, and also, you know, you might know that uh, artists have a reputation for being, you know, direct, radical. Maybe they're going to, you know, put you in a position of having to, you know, think differently about uh, your preconceptions and, you know, challenge you to perhaps, mm. uh, uh, you know, get into a place that you weren't necessarily going to be comfortable to do. Uh, yeah, one of the most um, important, uh, you know, ways to extend respect or to charm and disarm is to reflect back um, that you have actually taken the time uh, to find something out and to, and to be able to raise that in a context, something that never ceases to amaze me about politicians and I swear they all go to like politician school for this is their like amazing ability to remember everyone's name around mm -hmm. the table I don't know how many times I'm going to a meeting with you know a lord mayor a premier and you know there'll, there'll be a handful of us or there'll be 15 of us and like obviously they've been given some votes but they know who everyone is mm. um, and use the name constantly. Um, and Nadia, when someone says Nadia, um, you know, Nadia, <laughs> I, I really appreciated, Nadia, what you had to say about that. It does put us in a different mindset. It does. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, your day started out um, with some media as well. Tell us about that. Yeah, I did a little interview on uh, FBI radio um, at 9.30 in the morning. So I'd, um, I'd done the little the media advocacy training uh, with you guys leading up to that, um, which was fantastic and uh, was just really left me feeling quite um, empowered. Um, for those who don't know that, if you haven't seen it, you can also see that it's on YouTube. It's not amongst the vodcasts, but you can watch back that uh, media uh, advocacy training that they did with us as well. Ah, oh, did we put that on YouTube but not on the... Oh, I think I, I well, it's on there. it wasn't on the vodcast. Leia, yeah. tell us where it is. <laughs> <laughs> so the, um, our, our session, our extra session on... Yeah. Um, uh, on uh, how to be a media spokesperson. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so um, I got the interview by, I'm friends with Anna May Kirk, who's a producer for arts and culture on FBI radio, um, and just reached out to her. And I'd been, last time we'd had coffee, I'd been telling her about the NAVA advocacy courses anyway, um, and asked her if I thought that there'd be any uh, room for FBI to do any coverage on it. And sort of pitched it to them too, saying that, you know, I think a great angle too would be um, uh, focusing on the, you know, the advocacy training and uh, how great that's been as part of sort of skilling up the sector. Um, I thought that would appeal to the sort of demographic that listens to FBI as well. Um, yeah, and it was good. Um, <laughs> I definitely was uh, less nervous talking live on radio than I would have been if we hadn't have done that great uh -huh. training session for sure. Excellent. And I am a big fan of FBI. Um, mm. As many of you know, I was part of the broadcast trial that secured its, its full-time licence mm. more than 20 years ago uh, <laughs> and, um, yeah, have been deeply committed to community broadcasting for a very, very long time. Uh, I just think it is, um, uh, yeah, so enormously, enormously important. Now, um, Shah Sawani has just joined as well. Mm -hmm. And Shah, I'm going to um, 
I'm just going to press all the buttons to make you into a presenter as well so that you can join us and we can hear about your experience as well. Now, hopefully, my doing that is not going to um, um, make Nadia disappear or me disappear. Hopefully, neither of us will disappear. Uh, and instead, um, Isha will appear as well. Let me just see. If that is happening, um, I don't know if it's giving you an option there at your end, Shah, to turn on your um, your camera and your mic because I can't. Oh, there he is! <laughs> Yay! Hello. Hello. Hi, is there? Hi, Nadia. Oh, it's so hey, nice guys. to see you. Good. How are you? I'm. I'm good. I'm all right. It's very cold here in Melbourne. As you know, it's, <laughs> it's it freezing like here today. About an hour ago. I, I had my coat on for most of the day and I thought, yeah. oh my God, yeah, it is super duper cold. It's going to be very cold all week, um, mm. which makes it very, very lovely to be able to all get together. We've just been talking about um, um, how us down here was from Nadia's point of view, we're talking about doing the meetings with the MPs and um, just seeing the ways that they responded to us. Um, and, uh, oh, yes, and <laughs> obviously much colder in the Blue Mountains. I will not complain about the cold. I actually quite adore the cold. It's a good rugging up kind of time. Um, and Shah was also at several of the meetings on the day. So tell us, Shah, what it was like um, from your point of view. Um, I think for me, uh, um, it's always um, uh, good to to be able to find a, a platform and to to exercise, um, you know, uh, my um, my ideas and my, my my thoughts. It was definitely a, a good experience, um, an empowering experience to be able to. Uh, talk face to face to the legislator that make decisions for us, but uh, we are not in the picture, and yeah. they don't even know the condition uh, of artists, what they go through. Um, yeah, it was. Uh, I, I mean, I would, I would definitely do it again and again. And here in my council, I also. Um, now and then I engage with the uh, councillors and talk to them about art and the importance of art and uh, the importance of art, particularly in this time that uh, um, people are, there is no, there's no way to uh, express, there's, everyone is like, uh, force hiding in you know so it's very important in terms of both spiritually and also politically because as we are hiding the government is kind of sneaking policies legislations that we don't know so it's good to to have that direct face to face um, you know have access to the politicians in some ways to to tell them what we are going through and what should be done yeah that is um, a very important point that you just made which is yes while we are in hiding while we are in our homes especially those of us in victoria who are you know very much in our homes um, there are all sorts of things um, that the government is taking advantage of um, and sneaking through. We've talked a bit over this period about, and, and there's been some things recently as well, so about education, um, about obviously um, workplace relations and the privileging and the deprioritizing of certain workers, whether they're casual, uh, whether people are on... Uh, working visas because they're here from overseas. Um, uh, then also, of course, um, um, so on, on education um, uh, fees, but also um, the exclusion of universities from any kinds of support, the exclusion of local government uh, from any kind of support through um, um, 
the whole pandemic, the um, uh, what we've seen the last few days and late last week, these announcements about um, copyright reforms and um, the uh, really just the, the kowtowing to uh, the people who think it's just a little bit too difficult to have to pay artists licensing and royalties and, and, and so on for their work. Um, mm. And, you know, who knows what else is being rushed through. And, Sha, I really appreciated... Um, um, something you just said you also said at the meetings which was about the that balance between the spiritual and the political that art is something that we do you know for that um um you know that that really deep um it it it, it, it is a very personal um mm. Uh, issue, but then it's also a mode of expression that is political. Um, I would love to hear from you both about the spiritual and the political aspects of your work. But Shah, while we're talking, how, um, in terms of your own practice, how do you balance those two aspects, and especially right now at this difficult time? I mean, <clears throat> um, for me, the process of even when I'm making political work, uh, the process of engaging um, like uh, with the ideas uh, with my concepts that itself uh, is uh, in some ways uh, uh, spiritually um, satisfying because I uh, uh, it's not just the, the the works that I make it's just not about the politics if, if I I engage with material I engage with forms and then uh, uh, there are moments that I, you know, uh, <clears throat> that I that I that I find it really soothing that I have, uh, I have through art I have managed to entertain myself like because when you when you when you make artwork there is not just one side of like okay I'm making this artwork and then the result is this but within the process you um there are thoughts that co goes in your, in your mind that you sometime find funny uh, you know like the issue and then you look at the the politics of it and then you just sit and laugh <laughs> what what is going on here so and then uh, and then then through material investigation like uh, i it's really it it, it brings Every time I make an artwork, it brings new, new uh, discoveries, and that makes me really, really, really happy. That's the part that I enjoy the most. And then uh, after that, to share it and then to voice. Um, I mean, if you look at my work, my work, there is lots of beauty in it, but it is my. I think it's it is uh, the past twenty years are my presence in Australia within the political discourse uh, and my status has made me to, f to force my politics at the front of it. So uh, it doesn't mean that there's no enjoyment or there's no, there's no um, beauty or there's no um, um, exploration of uh, beauty within my work, but it's, I, I, so far I have chosen to put politics in, in like to kind of steer it in a way that I could uh, in uh, how do I say it? Um, it, like um, counter the the political rhetoric that is um, you know uh, uh, forced upon you know uh, us as a refugee or, or, or towards us so I'd like to counter that rhetoric and and kind of release my my you know tension and my uh, yeah so that's that's how i balance it like, it's always it's always it's always um pleasing to make artwork no matter if it's political or it's in search of like beauty or form yeah for me for me, the, the even the idea of pain and like I have come to know that it's it is there to so that you know 
what uh, happiness is or so that you really know what real happiness is and are in pain or where you are in I don't know in uh, stress or in uh, anxiety so so then you kind of break them and like really try to face them not just through the lens of like society but through your own you know strength and then you you come you you come to a point that you just it becomes enjoying like in, in some ways not not that I'm saying that pain is enjoyed but it's it's up to individuals how how they come to understand yeah Shah, thank you um thank you for the way that you've just put that um that the way that you just described that that really deep um uh, you know w w what it means personally the the the, the challenge and i guess the the burden um of creating art um in, in any circumstance let alone extremely uh difficult ones and ones where we feel that the um you know the overriding political context isn't a favorable one um that is something that takes um great um personal strength um, and it also takes great personal strength to create those ways that mean that you are exploring what's difficult, what's painful, um, you know, f finding that way through those sensitivities. Um, I think it's, um, um, it is, you know, it's, it's an extraordinary undertaking um, and it's, yeah, it's really good of you to describe it to us in this way because it puts everything that we're talking about, you know, we're talking about it in such abstract terms in different ways all year. Um, yeah, it, it puts that in, in, in great perspective. And I have to say I particularly appreciated the way that politicians responded to you um, and your questions last week. Um, and as you say, having to kind of, yeah, think differently about, okay, well, yes, this is a particular person who has had these experiences. I've been thinking in a generic politician way. Well, actually, um, this is why uh, mm. artists create work. This is why you, as an artist, create work and why you're compelled to. Yeah, and also, I guess, art, um, I was listening to Richard's uh, video the other day looking at that Nava has produced where he said oh, with that, Richard uh, Bell, yes. Yeah, Richard Bell, where he said that art must be very powerful that whenever um, the right wing politician politics take um, the government or becoming um, forms government, the first thing that they cut is the arts budget because I guess they want to stupefy stupefy the nation, like make them stupid so that whatever they could um, do um, they just can they do it. So whatever they want to do, they do it. So that, you know, there's no one to question them. And I think it. I can speak from experience that yeah, if I had gone and become a um, someone to work in the farm or um, or work in a factory, not that I'm saying that those works are bad, but because I have chosen to become an artist. Um, well, at the beginning, it was a romantic kind of that I want to make art and beautiful work and sell them or become rich. But then when, as Richard said, uh, similarly to Richard, as I understood that I can do more, more, uh, um, I don't know, and, and, and not, not that I want to change the world, but maybe in small bits, but to change myself or to change or to some, some in some in some ways not to change myself that I can I can have the strength to uh, to kind of stand up to the bully of the powerful through my yep. work. You know? yep. So yep. and that uh, that is strength comes through the art. Otherwise, if I was a, a factory worker, what what could I think? <laughs> maybe a strike no then I would be kicked off of the job but here I can I can say anything I like I can you know as long as it doesn't offend offend mess like you know it's 
make work and and it doesn't matter if it doesn't change like it doesn't create change at that moment but uh, it kind of i can in some ways I am, i'm recording the moment so that for the future generation or for my community um yeah Thank you again very much. I'm going to say bye to you both in just a sec um, uh, because um, um, I can see Nicholas Picard has joined us um, on our system. We only have three of us on at the, at the one time. A couple of others who want to have a chat as well. But Nadia had her hand up to, to, to respond to what Shah had said as well. Oh, I just wanted to say, Shah, that um, hearing you say all of that, it reminds me exactly what we're advocating for um, and why we're doing this program at all in the first place is to protect the the ability um, for art to do what art does and what art can do, which is um, speak uh, strongly to issues, um, express, you know, voices, um, and that's exactly what we're trying to, to enable and protect. So... I think that that's a great thing to have heard you speak on that, particularly in this wrap-up session, to give some context to why we're doing this whole thing in the first place. So thank you so much. Oh, massive thanks to both of you. Now, hopefully, I'm now going to press the correct sequence of buttons to uh, so that you are still joining us, but we won't be able to see and hear you. But thank you so much for uh, joining us just now. And also, massive thanks for being part of last week's meetings as well. So I'm going to press the buttons. How do I? Oh, or possibly Leia's pressing some buttons because she's much quicker and better at this. Uh, so thank you very much, Leia. Now, Nicholas Picard, uh, we're just making you a presenter, and so hopefully um, that means that you are happily uh, in front of um, your mic and camera. Um, so as you'll recall, Nicholas joined us some weeks ago, um, and we had that great conversation um, about policy and um, the political um, uh, advisor life and a range of things. But Nicholas, welcome. Hi, how are you? I'm all right, how are you? Good, thanks. Where are you joining us from today? My house in the northern beaches of Sydney, where there's a bit of building work going on. So you'll hear a drill every now and again. Look, that's, yeah, so I've become very used to the construction industry, who are my new best friends. Uh, and, well, the northern um, beaches are the capital of, tra the, the, the trading capital of Australia. Right? Ah, excellent. Well, uh, we know how important the, 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 the tradies are to the current political outlook. Tradies are everything. They are. Now, I don't know how much of, um, I'd, I'd explained to everyone earlier that Nicholas was joining us after another meeting, and so I don't know how much of um, Shah and Nadia's conversation you just heard, but I was so struck by the way that Nadia talked about um, our experiences with politicians and the particular, you know, tactical moves that they take during a meeting, but also Shah speaking as um, um, an artist um, who arrived in Australia as a refugee who has um, uh, taken that spiritual and political balance of his work as, as being terribly personally important and as a way um, as an artist in the sense to stand up uh, and certainly to stand up against um, bullying uh, and that feeling of being bullied by government. Um, we have spent, you know, the year looking at different tactics and so on for that. Um, how do you see, I guess, some of the impacts of um, our um, meetings and, um, and online activity next week? Um, what's been some of the outcomes of Arts Down the Hill for you? Look, I think anything that increases that uh, dialogue and engagement with politicians is going to be, you know, central to any of the uh, activity that occurs. Um, it, it, it's never a wasted opportunity when an artist gets in front of uh, a member of parliament, um, especially when that artist, you know, is speaking to their local member because, you know, they need to know and they, they need to know, um, you know, the, the extraordinary depth of talent across the country in all sorts of areas and regions um, and understand what that impact is to their local area. Because at the end of the day, they're going to be very locally uh, orientated um, with, uh, uh, with what they want to achieve um, as a local MP. Um, so I think that that is going to be... Um, 
uh, I think that is one of the great outcomes uh, from a government relations perspective. Uh, so, I mean, having worked in the music space at the moment, music artists talking directly to to, to government is the most effective way of of, of getting um, uh, you know uh, their voice heard um, in a, a policy sense. Um, so that that's that's for me the number one top line. Excellent, because we are about to have joining us now Anna Glynn, who uh, did organise a meeting with her local MP, um, and we're just pressing the buttons. Anna, I think I have pressed some buttons, and hopefully it may be some buttons for you also to be pressing. So we're both pressing the buttons, and you are joining us hopefully in, in, in just a sec. But while Anna is joining us, uh, uh, the... Um, amount of engagement that we had on the day so as well as the meetings that that we ran um there were 12 meetings that you all facilitated with your mps um and can i just say thank you and how fantastic because something that we really stressed um all year and that nicholas and others told us is that it's all well and good to meet at parliament house but to meet locally um and have those conversations locally is just so so important um and nicholas we mentioned earlier that to our great um you know uh surprise and delight uh oh there's Anna now um to our great surprise and delight there were mps including trent Zimmerman, the member for north um sydney um this is called north sydney isn't it? he's elected it is north yeah sydney. um had done his research um, on individual artists and had questions to ask, um, which was which was quite fantastic. But Anna, welcome. Where are you today? Um, in my studio in the Shoalhaven. Um, it's very nice here. Not raining. <laughs> Not well, as cold great. as Melbourne. That's great, Anna. That's 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 really fantastic. Uh, and so, tell us what you did on our stay on the hill. Um. Well, I, I contacted Fiona Phillips in June to sort of, uh, I, I think I treated it a bit like courting, you know, the old fashioned way of being polite and, you know, reaching out and because um, I didn't want to be too pushy or forceful. I, I didn't see that there was going to be any way to move forward if, you know, I came on like that. So, um we eventually got um, um, an invitation to Fiona to come up to my studio and visit and Anne Stafford, who I didn't know very well, but now through this, we've become great friends. So excellent. Bring your people yes. together. This is good. Yep. We worked as a team and Anne wrote letters to the um, state and local politicians. Um, and I, I worked to get Fiona Phillips, our local member up here. So we, we worked hard for a few days. Um, Fiona, it was, it was almost a bit more like a social visit, but I think that I, I didn't really want to go beyond that at the beginning. I think that this is just like the start of a conversation with Fiona and now I feel quite comfortable to contact her office and to raise... Um, points that I think she might want to consider supporting or not supporting. Um, she's very friendly, um, very personable. Um, and I also, because we've had so many disasters where we are, you know, the bushfires, the floods, the, you know, COVID is just another one of a list of things that we've had here. So um, I think we were very lucky to get her and I, I didn't want to be too pushy. I think that sounds like a very wise approach. Nicholas, how, how important is it to, to make that first meeting social? That's, that's the key, really. You know, it's, um, it's the start of a relationship. It's not the ending, you know, and, and oftentimes dealing with um, speaking to a lot of music industry stakeholders and, and various um, arts groups, often they think, oh, I've got a meeting with, with so-and-so and it's going to be the last time I ever meet with them again. There's a little bit of a sort of a, um, it's a sort of a strange time constraint that they, they put 
layer onto the the pressure of the meeting, which is already quite stressful, really. You just it, this is just the start of a conversation, and I think that from what you've just said, you'll be able to go to back to Fiona whenever issues arise that affect you and your practice and your profession. Um, uh, and eventually, hopefully, Fiona, being an ALP Member of Parliament, will be in government. So then you'll have that person, <laughs> then you'll have that person who, you know, is potentially, you know, um, a backbencher in government or potentially a minister. So, I mean, you know, it's all uh, laying the seeds. Uh, the other thing to always remember is that you'll have duty sentences as well. So you can now take this to another level. So each state has um, their senators and you'll have government senators that will represent the Shoalhaven. So that's the next level to engage uh, on, on a government thing. But this is the best, best start, first step. Mm. I think it was good too because um, some of the material that Nava had shared, Esther had shared the... Um, the Australia Council stats for Gilmore. So oh, I, love, I, was I love that website. Then, My favourite yeah, website. I was then able to follow up with a thank you email to um, Fiona because I'd, I'd mentioned that. So um, I was able to assist her, um, which I think is a nice position. I did notice that when I talked about some of the art things like being a moving, you know, doing moving image and she didn't understand what I was talking about. So I've been thinking I'd I'd like to see if she's available for just a, a general catch up with what's happening in the arts chat. So she has a comprehension of the terminology that artists use. Absolutely. And introducing her to other people and other types of artists who are yeah. working in different mediums with that you know that are living in the area as well. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, that's a really good point, um, Anna, is that um, you can now be in a position to be that conduit. So if you have, you've had that meeting, and as you say, it's like a courting, so maybe yeah. now you're dating and, you know, you want to meet each other's friends. Uh, send you know, flowers. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. But the maybe. kind of, you know, starting to meet each other's friends and, like, let me introduce you to some artists. Um, you know, here's the Australia Council electorate profiles. Here's some stats on the numbers of artists. Now, like, let's actually make that real. These are people in your electorate who are voting for, you know, someone. Um, and, and and then really kind of building their relationship. And I also want to pick up on something that you just said, Anna, about the language that we use. Um, because, um, yeah, we can, um, you know, we talked about this a little bit during this year, but those like Mish Grigor, who's on the, on, on the call today, others who were involved last year, um, we remember that through the day we had this sort of evolution in the way that artists spoke about their practice. You know, at, at the beginning of the day, we realised that um, using a certain kind of language makes sense among us in the arts community, but can be off-putting for people in the general public, for politicians, not because it's um, technical or, um, you know, um, uh, you know, that it's it's focused on specific, um, uh, you know, kind of art or industry matters, but because it can be intimidating. People can think, oh, well, I'm going to use the wrong words and this artist is going to think I'm an idiot or I'm not going to be able to explain it properly. And so it's so important that we also think about uh, what are the different ways to explain our practice and um Mish, who's here with us, um, I just love the way that uh, Mish and Nadia and Shah were saying, well, you know, these are, these are some of the things that are important to me in my practice. You know, I make work about this. I, I, I do make that crazy feminist work. I like to experiment. I like to push boundaries. Um, Nicholas, what kinds of advice do you give to artists? And we've talked about this a bit in our, you know, preparing and being a media spokesperson and so on. But what sorts of advice do you give to artists um, when it comes to, yeah, having that conversation when you want to talk about the practice but you don't want to, um, you know, put someone off, particularly an MP? Yeah, I, look, I, I completely get um, what that challenge might be because, you know, we all lead, you know, live in our, uh, you know, relative bubbles and we have our you know, communities and we have our culture and our, our ways of talking with one another. We we develop that shorthand and then suddenly you you, you get these um, 
get that meeting between an artist and a, and a member of parliament. And that can jar, that can jar. Um, not, I think the best approach is really to start from the beginning. The best approach is to simplify um, and not assume any knowledge whatsoever. And then you might be suddenly pleasantly surprised and they'll be able to say, oh, well, actually I went to such and such exhibition or such and such show or I saw this, you know, public art or, you know, things like that. So I think um, you'll start to find that um, common ground or alternatively, you'll find the gaps and often they're big gaps. And that's the sort of stuff that you can start thinking about with follow-ups over the years uh, as ways to sort of fill those gaps. Um, so I think, uh, you know, starting at the beginning, but I think it's also really important. And recently I was involved um, the chair of APRA AMCOS, which is the organisation that I work for, the music um, organisation, recently just gave a speech to the National Press Club. And, you know, I think it's really important in, in talking to government that you don't lose your identity and as speaking as an artist. So it is a, it is a bit of a balance, but you can't let, you know, um, you can't, you know, let that get in the way of, of, of a conversation. So it's, it's, it's... I think just starting at the beginning is the easiest. I, I also invited Fiona to um, open my exhibition when it returns from its tour later ah. in December and she's agreed to do that. And the Jervis Fantastic. Bay Maritime Museum haven't had um, any federal polys involved in exhibition launches. So I think that's going to be a nice sort of meeting of of um, different performers in the field here, so yeah. Oh, good work, good work, Anna. And I'm seeing from um, uh, from the chat there that you've already got Caroline Phillips uh, is volunteering to join you in that meeting. And Stafford says that the South Coast is embracing the development mm -hmm. of artists through the strategic plan for the dairy community inclusivity. Anna is already an amazing artist <laughs> in that area. <laughs> And widely acknowledged uh, by all of us for her work. Systemic advocacy works, says Anna. <laughs> <laughs> but there you go, Anna. Didn't expect the instant adulation, but um, it was it was super fantastic to see you know, the images that you share, uh, to see that you had you know taken the time to to, to do that. But also, exactly as you said um, at the outset of describing this, that it is a relationship that you know it can um, you know it 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 it's that. Um, social um, extension again. You know, you bring someone into your circle. Uh, when you think about how the arts, you know, the arts in the broadest way, structures our social lives. What happens in the foyers of theatres? What happens at an opening? Um, there are so many ways that we've become accustomed to that this year, of course, has disrupted in some deeply profound ways. But these, it's not just the language that we take for granted. It's not just the talking to each other and being in the sector that we take for granted. But, you know, we, we do tend to take for granted the those uh, platforms of our socialising with one another. If we can invite MPs all over Australia to be part of that, to have those incidental encounters at an opening, uh, you know, in the foyer of a theatre, um, at, at, at a live music event, um, if we're extending that, that social um, world, then it doesn't just open up those opportunities for casual encounter and, 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 you know, making them part of our conversation, but it also extends our culture. You know, people are saying on the chat uh, when, we, when Sha was talking about, um, you know, that, that oppressive sense of, of, um, uh, of, of policy at the moment and, you um, Wendy Garden uh, from AAASZ points out this is why they're increasing humanities degrees by 113%. They don't want thinkers. Sandra Tobias says yes, no to critical and, and, and creative thinkers. We've talked about this notion of the quiet Australians. 
one of the big problems that we have with you know so so much is the division, the divisiveness that we're seeing across Australian uh, and, and across the world, but, but but across you know Australian culture at the moment. Some of the best ways for us to bridge that before imagining that we're going to ideologically change a politician, some of the fundamental ways are for us to bridge our social means and involve them in the everydayness of, of what we do. Um, so, Anna, enormous thanks. Um, we will say bye to you now. I think Leia's going to press the buttons and, and say bye. And I'm going to keep Nicholas for just a sec to talk about um, some broader um, next steps and so on for us now because this program um, and in about uh, 15 minutes I'll, I'll look back on each one of those and and, um, um, and, and you know really rethink speakers and so on but Nicholas um, the aim of the advocacy program leading into Arts Day on the Hill and of course Arts Day on the Hill itself was to connect and skill up a whole bunch of advocates, um, as we say in our handbook, not just once off and not just in an emergency, not just around the particular day that is Arts Down the Hill, but it's really important to be able to secure that critical mass, um, but, be, but to be able to do that in an, in an ongoing way. Uh, hopefully in an ongoing way that helps to preclude the kinds of funding emergencies that we've seen in the past but also a way that means that those political relationships remain meaningful. So um, given the conversations we've been having all year, you know, in this group and, and for those who are here now, what's your best advice for next steps, um, drawing on, on what we've done and what we have so far, but also looking at um, what's on the policy horizon at the moment, including a couple of the little surprises in the last week? Um, so it's, um, it's now August and we had the election last May, uh, which means that we're sliding into about the halfway point of this term of government. So I think it's always uh, good to know where you're at in the political cycle. So federally, they've really got only um, sort of 18 to 20 months left of this term, which is not actually a very long time. So you already need to start thinking about, um, you know, uh, uh, we actually need to start thinking about as a sector, what it is that we want to prioritise in the lead up to the next election. And what are the things that we want uh, both government and opposition to be talking about as far as priorities for our sector. So I think in many ways, COVID has been um, an extraordinary um, economic, social and cultural leveller in many ways. And I think it gives an enormous opportunity to reset a lot of conversations. Um, I think that the appreciation for art, music, literature, film has um, increased quite substantially. Um, you know, I think there was a great appreciation that our sector was one of the first hit and, and, and it's going to be one of the hardest to, to get back up online. Um, the threat now is that uh, we lose a lot of cultural infrastructure, um, not, not, not the big public cultural infrastructure. I'm talking about the feeding ground, you know, the small galleries, the small live music venues, the small theatres, you know, and I think this is something that is going to be escalating quite a lot. Um, cultural policy at the moment is pretty, you know, fly by the seat of your pants. Normally we can do a lot more planning. So that's why it's important to think about the long term out, what does post COVID and is there such a thing as post COVID? Um, what does the cultural landscape, the patchwork look like? Um, and how do we build it better? Um, I think certainly from uh, from my side of the, the sector, uh, you know, we often refer to ourselves as the originators of the gig economy, mm. and we can see what happens to gig workers when things like this occur. They're at the bottom of the food chain, uh, and it's just not a sustainable model. So what is it that we reimagine as far as uh, how artists and creators are remunerated for their work? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's really astute to point out um, 
uh, particularly that moment in the political cycle, because um, the, some of the issues that we discuss are, of course, long term. We want to see long term change and we want to see it sustained. And sometimes problems can seem, uh, you know, problems and policy priorities can seem so far away in terms of their achievement that you think, well, it's going to take years and years to build that up. But in terms of the political pragmatics of a situation, um, the election cycle means a great deal. Um, and um, while uh, in the bureaucracy they're working, you know, in a particular slow and steady way, the political cycle means that uh, there is a leapfrogging, there's a piggybacking, um, there are opportunities. Um, something that a lot of colleagues and I have been reflecting on the last little while um, is that while on the one hand, when we look at the policy and funding outcomes for this year, it just in terms of COVID response, um, you know, it's, uh, it's hardly been um, uh, adequate. Uh, it's hardly been successful in terms of, you know, the way government understands what's needed and, 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 and what they've invested. Um, but equally dismally, we're not alone in that, you know, when you look at education, we look at, you know, a whole range of other areas, um, there is a, you know, a, a bit of a pattern of ignoring or undermining a range of sectors, unfortunately. But on the plus side, as you just pointed out, the broader public and media impact that we've had, we've had arts and culture mentioned, um, you know, in pieces, in media pieces by economists, we've had um, political and economic journalists put questions to a range of politicians, including the Prime Minister, and not in conversations that are about the arts, but that are about um, all the issues more broadly. And we seem to be in a position where come that next election campaign, issues about um, artists' practice, the sector and the industry, we can very much expect those to be um, election issues. We can very much expect to see that momentum maintained. So then for us as individuals in, in, in this group, what are some of the practical things um, that we can do as individuals to make sure that that momentum uh, is, is maintained and that the relationships are maintained that lead to that? Look, um, I, I just, I was just, while you were talking, I was, I was re reflecting on that rather difficult situation that artists always have in, you know, it's all very well to welcome MPs and ministers or whatever into, yeah. you know, foyers and, and into the fold and to have that close quarter of conversation. But at the end of the day, artists are always going to create stuff that is going to be controversial, that is going to divide, that is going to. So this is something that I think we're yet to really you know, um, properly work out as 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 as, as far as a um, important policy priority is concerned. Um, I think at the moment we're still in a recovery stage. You know, we're sort of in the post Brandis post. Um, you know, fires. Yeah ecological yeah. climate, COVID. Um, you know, so we're in a recovery stage. But but people are starting to look at the you know at the next stage of what that rebuild uh, looks like. And I, I think that's that's why, you know, it's important to sort of step back, try and put your head above, uh, um, lift your head up and, and look at the horizon and try and imagine what it is that that, that is next. Um, that's, that's why, you know, things like Arts Down the Hill are so important because they're the beginning of conversations. And it was kind of what we were talking about before. It's the beginning of conversations. It's never the end. Um, and it's it's the start of what you want to try and create out of uh, that engagement. Yeah, absolutely. Nicholas, thank you. It's been really fantastic to have you present those few weeks ago, but also to have, um, your insights now. Um, there's obviously, there's a lot of great work for us all um, in the sector to be doing together. Um, but I know I speak for everyone in, uh, in, in saying thank you for your work um, and the expertise that you have contributed uh, to this entire program. So thank you very, very much. My pleasure. Now, we are again going to press the buttons. That means that Nicholas is going to vanish for possibly one of, oh, let me see now. There, um, I, um, I'm pressing somewhere. Okay, there it goes. <laughs>
<laughs> so that's magical. Thank you for pressing the buttons more quickly than I could. Um, and of course, if you're still there, Nicholas, you're welcome to stick around, but totally understand if you've had um, quite a long day. Now, I'm just going to scroll back on the chat to make sure that I haven't missed um, any particular questions and points that people have made. And then um, let's uh, reflect on some of the the specific outcomes um, of the day and some of what happens next. So, um, oh yes, uh, thank you again to Anne and to Anna for, for posting there. Um, Kate Smith notes that um, um, just in appreciating what Shah was saying, it can be difficult to talk about the spiritual side of making when advocating. And so good to present art as being not so much about selling. Um, yeah, I think that's, that is deeply special. Um, uh, Will Renu, uh, it's sad to you the government has snuck through so many important issues during the pandemic. Yes, it is. Really need to find consistent and manageable ways to police the government. Mm, yes, uh, very, very frustrating. Um, um, Desiree Tan, uh, disagree with the policy, but it's classes to imply such thinkers do not exist outside of institutions. Oh yes, no, I'm, I'm sure that, um, uh, I'm sure that uh, Wendy meant more broadly as well. We, you know, we, we, we can talk about the, the danger of attacking universities without assuming uh, that there aren't great thinkers um, elsewhere, absolutely. Um, and okay, still scrolling down. Oh yes, Nadia and Anne pointing out that there was cake. Uh, very important for breaking down barriers. Shah points out dinner or lunch eating helps certainly when you can extend that hospitality. Um, yeah, that is so fantastic. Now Anne Stafford asks, will there be a group that we can follow after this and demonstrate who the advocacy were able to reach? Um, so um, as in, um, demonstrate who the advocates were able to reach. Okay, yes. So uh, um, as we we're saying earlier, we're, we're going to put out a survey to get a sense of what everyone did on the day uh, so that we can really get a sense of what those broader numbers were. Um, but on the day, we had um, five meetings that we facilitated and another 12 that you all facilitated. Um, there were many hundreds of engagements online. Um, I've just got the exact number. 284, was it, Leah? Um, and, and um, several hundred thousand um, uh, social media um, uh, impacts more, more broadly. Um, there were 21 artists who, um, uh, who met with MP during the day, and we've got a couple of them here. Uh, so Mish is here, Caroline is here, um, and, yeah, it was just fantastic uh, to be able to do that with you um, and accordingly says Hello from Wajah Ballot Country and her experiences on Wednesday the 12th was full of extremes. For context, the Mali is an incredibly safe national seat, not typically sensitive to the arts sector. New to the National Party demanding a softening of the government policy on university fee structures to preference humanities was unexpected and came on the 11th, thrilling me completely. Me too, Anna, wasn't that great news? And then in the next moment, Dr. Anne Webster MP stood me up at, in order to meet with Bridget McKenzie, a member who is on record having shifted resources away from this very seat, from high to low, but fascinating all the way. And it reminds me um, where in the Mallee you are. Um, um, I have spent um, some good time up there in my... Oh, you're in Mad Natamak. Of course you are. Natamak, of course, being one of the great arts capitals of Australia um, with... Uh, yes, it is. If anybody does not know about Natamak, you really do need to Google right now and get yourself over there at the earliest opportunity. Um, uh, extraordinary range of, of artists, but also just this fascinating mix between... Um, um, artists and um, equally adventurous mountain climbers because of Mount Arapiles, which is um, just near Natamak. There is a Natty Fringe, which is every other year. I'm assuming it's not a fringe year this year, Anna, for all the obvious reasons, um, but that is seriously one of the most magnificent um, arts weekends. You can have a deep sense of community and connectedness. Uh, oh, yeah, great. 2021. That, that's late 2021 uh, will be the next Natty Fringe. Um, 
always an, an excellent experience. Um, so uh, Leia has just pointed out 285 conversations and then the potential uh, social media reach of 245,000, nearly 246,000. Um, a number of things have come out of it already. So as Nadia said, there were MPs who asked for specific follow-ups of documents um, which we provided. There is also very likely to be um, some kind of parliamentary inquiry uh, if we watch the uh, web page for the Standing Committee on Communications and the Arts, um, there is very likely to be um, inquiry into the impact of COVID-19 on the arts and the government response. And that's going to be exceptionally important to make sure that we can all contribute to that, but also that the entire parliament is taken it seriously and those um, committee members are able to ask some good forensic questions and uh, commission reports and do all of that work. Oh, thanks, Anna, for uh, pasting the link to the Natty Fringe there. Um, and of course, um, as I've been saying all year, one of the most important ways as a group to stay together is to become a member of NAVA, uh, which starts from as little as $7.50 a month, because um, NAVA is going to be looking in many, many ways at continuing the momentum of this group, looking at different programs and materials. Thank you to Leia for posting that link to membership. Um, and now I'm just going to open up the advocacy program again um, so that I can say some thank yous. And while I'm doing that, just in the 15 minutes that we have left, please in the chat list any questions that you've got for me so that we can cover them uh, between now and 5.30. So first of all, it's a massive thanks to Leah Reed who is NAVA's Communications and Advocacy Manager, um, who has just been um, uh, extraordinary and, um, you know, just so shrewd and clever with, with all of this. Um, and, um, you know, it's just been, it's been wonderful to work with you, Leia, so thank you. Enormous thanks to the entire NAVA team for all the work that everyone has done on this program. And also thanks to Daniel Beeson, the philanthropist, uh, who has made a donation to NAVA for last year's and this year's and next year's Arts Day on the Hill program um, so that um, we're able to continue and really build on that momentum next year. Oh, Nadia, I haven't met with Trent yet, just the emails we've exchanged so far. Um, and so I will look forward to, to yeah, seeing him in, in the future. Um, I also want to thank um, every one of the speakers in the program. And again, uh, they were Alex Marston, and she is uh, here with us this evening. Hello, Alex, uh, from the National Director of the Australian Museums and Galleries Association. Also, Anne Robertson, who is the um, Executive Director of the Public Galleries Association of Victoria and also a member of the National Public Galleries Alliance. Um, see, this is not very easy to see for you all. Let me just zoom in a bit. We then had Nadina Dixon and Celinda Carvalho uh, reflecting on last year's Arts Day on the Hill. And so you can bet that, you know, this time next year, we'll be grabbing some of you to join for a session like that to reflect on what this year's was like. And then Nadina Dixon and Wesley and Enoch, thank you to both of them for the First Nations Advocacy Week. Um, um, and then, of course, we've had... Um, the um, each of our four weeks um, reflecting as you know, Q&A with a politician and JA of course was also um, um, it, also met with us on the day and he and I speaking of next meetings have been playing phone tag ever since. Um, JA is someone who approaches his work and meetings in ways that seem very casual, very offhand, very odd, you know, and he's a bit of a, you know, he's just this larrikin type, you know, Aussie bloke. When it comes to follow-ups, he is one of the most business-like, focused politicians I've ever come across. So it's an important, um, important note there, important lesson to us all to not underestimate politicians. They are very good at their jobs. So he's extremely keen to follow up on some of the things that were discussed at our meetings around art and disability and things that he can pursue. And so we'll be having that conversation um, and everyone who met with JA and all of you really, I encourage everyone to get in touch with all the politicians here that we're about to discuss uh, and say hi 
um, and thank them and continue the conversation. Uh, and then also with Zoe McKenzie and Darren Rudd on that day as well. Um, just seeing the notes there on the chat. Yes, it is awesome uh, that next year's is secured with philanthropic funding. And thank you, Larissa. Yeah, yeah we, we, we've, we, we've got to be able to continue that. That was fantastic. And Anna Glynn is saying, yes, his office replied straight away when she invited JA to her studio. Excellent. Really, really great. Um, so then we went into understanding policy development with John Daly from the Grattan Institute. Thank you, John. Um, John um, has now stood down um, as CEO of the Grattan Institute, a really great succession plan there with Danielle Wood as CEO. Uh, and she's just such a clear and articulate um, thinker. And I'm going to look forward to following the Grattan Institute's work. Dr. Jackie Bailey on those global comparisons, really fantastic um, to, because she had done so much work um, uh, and obviously through um, her consultancy and they're doing some work with the Australia Council now, which is fantastic. And Mike Murdoch, big thank you to Mike. Um, uh, again, I was just chuffed that, that he was involved at all. He gave us so many fantastic insights. And then, of course, wrapping up with Maria Van Bakunel, who was also an extremely focused, attentive um, uh, co-chair of the Parliamentary Friendship Group and some fantastic follow-ups with her since that time. Um, understanding the media, it was fantastic to have Michaela Boland and George Megalogenis just to really get into what makes news, how does arts and politics and broader issues connect, so massive thanks to both of them. And then, of course, as we were saying earlier, the danger of political co-option, I thought it was so generous of Abdul uh, and Jane, uh, but particularly for Abdul Abdullah, given, you know, what a traumatic time that was to speak in such detail um, about that. Um, oh, Anne has got to head off to Family in the Mountains. Um, great to see you, Anne. See you soon. Um, and then uh, the Q&A with Adam Bant, and he was so forensically specific wasn't he you know he is how you you know kind of shoehorn people into uh how you shoehorn politicians into bypassing a, a campaign that you might want to be launching i thought that was super useful and then finally uh understanding the politics nicholas pickard thank you again nicholas um, um and mark texter i thought it was fascinating to have you know those different political perspectives of nicholas and mark but also taking us through the trajectories to how they got to where they are and then telling us in very pragmatic terms um, um, the, uh, the particular focus that, that they've taken and also the relationship between data, polling, um, you know, a range of different kinds of um, advisory approaches. And then, of course, Helen O'Neill, how to meet. Um, that was, yes, super useful. Is Helen with us this evening? I'm just scrolling on the chat. No, she's not. But big thank you to Helen. Um, and then, of course, all of us. Um, so it is enormous and massive thanks to all of you. There are 1,200 and something people who registered for the NAVA Advocacy Program and people have come and gone as has been most practical and most useful. Uh, and accordingly says, Daniel Beeson's a complete star. I will pass that on. Uh, it has indeed been extraordinary. Yeah, I've just been, yeah, so delighted to be able to do this together. Thank you, Adam. Um, and yeah, yeah. Um, and that's the thing, you can keep checking back in because the vodcasts are there. Um, and the transcripts and so on. Um, Felicity says, thank you. Oh, fantastic. Can this and then continue? Could Nava now with Penny B? <laughs> Don't call Penelope Penny. She can't stand that just quietly. Penelope Benton is our acting CEO from Friday. So can Nava with Penelope Benton partner in a meta alliance of all the creative unions, guilds and associations and their members to articulate a new cultural strategy and put it to government? I think there is going to be a lot of that kind of cooperation happening in a range of different ways. Uh, so I think we can absolutely look forward to that really great work. Uh, and particularly one of um, Penelope's, um, you know, really strong strong, clear focuses in the next um, while is also about the strengthening and the revision of the NAVA code of practice. Uh, you know, we talk about policy in different ways and there's federal government, state, local government policy uh, that, that affects us all. But of course, best practice 
and the ways that we articulate that and the ways that we uphold that um, are also a very important way of making sure that artists can sustain careers, that the sector can survive and thrive, and that we have, you know, um, a world of art making um, and art experiencing that enriches all of us. So it's also super duper important. Now, something you mentioned earlier, and please let me know in the chat, some of you mentioned earlier the connections you've made with each other through this. Um, and I'm just delighted that at least one of those resulted in an MP meeting that you did together. So if there are uh, people in this group that you've wanted to connect with, you know that you can click on the attendees list and send someone a, a, a private message that you don't have to do it on the chat. But please use this opportunity right now. If you want to ask someone for contact details or ways to stay in touch or you want to get to know their practice, please use this opportunity right now to connect to that person and uh, make sure that you have got that opportunity. So the way to do that is if you just click on someone's name in the attendees list. Now, see, I'm assuming that you can see what I can see as well as the chat, um, but you can just click and um, and then select private message or what is it called? I'm just clicking on one of you, private chat. Um, at least I'm very much hoping that that works for you as it also works for me at this end. Um, but please, yeah, take that opportunity to do that. And I guess most importantly, as we've seen throughout um, this whole year, there are all sorts of issues um, that compel us to be stronger advocates. Um, advocacy can be and should be as simple and as straightforward as being yourself, extending that social sphere into the political, supporting each other, because of course this takes its toll when the political situation isn't favourable, um, to, you know, draw those links and connections um, among all of these groups um, in the ways that make sense for you to prioritise. Do go back um, with the guides here and um, do some of the activities together um, with others, you know, um, do a bit of that role play, talk about how you talk about your work. Um, have a look at um, uh, different kinds of uh, advocacy strategies. Maybe you want to make in that self-critical way your own personal um, advocacy strategy using all the different tools that we have to hand, uh, you know, using emotion, using data, you know, using what you've got. Um, here again is my uh, super duper very brief history of arts policy in Australia. Um, what can we get out of, you know, these moves and what's happening politically in Australia at the moment? Um, uh, not forgetting, of course, as has been mentioned a couple of times, the Australia Council's electorate profiles tool. It is so useful. It's so very, very useful. You know, dip into that, choose your electorate, see what comes up, um, and you can, you know, maintain those relationships. Um, and then, of course, using the NAVA Advocacy Toolkit, it's on the website in a range of different ways, and choosing for yourself what do you want to do next? This has been only the beginning for our work together. And you might only have small amounts of time or you might really want to get into something big. Whether you are engaging socially, whether you want to do something that is a little bit more activist and stay in touch with politicians and, um, you know, uh, and senators, uh, as Nicholas pointed out. Or maybe you want to have some of that ongoing citizen level, civic level engagement. You can find out what's going on in politics this week, if, if Parliament was sitting, by looking at what's on the agenda. You can look at inquiries that are accepting submissions and contribute. So, for example, at the moment, the government is looking for feedback on that education bill. There's an exposure draft out at the moment. Um, and you can keep staying in touch with, with what NAVA is doing and advocating for. Um, 
Anna Glynn points out that self-reflection in a big way uh, is going to be important and there are also tools and guides um, on the NAVA website about exactly that, you know, what are the ways in which we ask ourselves questions to reflect on our practice that is so enormously, enormously important. So everyone, as from me, Really, really heartfelt thanks to all of you. I have found this so invigorating to be able to spend each week through what has been an incredibly difficult year for all of us to connect with each other, to be emboldened by each other, to really invigorate and be galvanised by each other. Um, and to realise, of course, that each one of us, uh, the voice of each one of us is so incredibly important. Um, I encourage you all to continue. Oh, how fantastic Larissa's got Jennifer Howard, her local MP, visiting her home studio next week. Coming snack, smack bang at lunchtime. Very good. Vegan recipes to charm and disarm. That is absolutely perfect, Larissa, as we say. Um, you know, in, 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 um, in the Greek culture, that notion of hospitality, you extend, you know, you create that offer, you create a sense of a mutual obligation and trust. Uh, it is almost a contract that, that emerges, who is the guest and who is the host and what will happen next time, how you make best use of that engagement. Politics fundamentally is about people. It's about how we express our values and about the world that we want to live in. And fundamentally, it's about empowering ourselves to realise that we do have a say in the decisions that affect our lives and that as individuals, but also as a big distributed group across Australia, we can do great things together. So thank you, everyone. Uh, please stay connected with NAVA so that the advocacy of all of us can be strengthened. And together, uh, let's work towards uh, sustaining and inspiring the arts. Let us build a contemporary art that is ambitious and fair. Thank you so very, very much, everyone.